Good morning, everybody. All of our campuses, McKinney, Frisco West, all of you watching online, all of us here at Frisco East. Um, so excited about this new series. We're starting today. So you came on the right day. A series called we're calling 99. And from yesterday, so we have service on Saturday nights uh, here at West, uh, here at East, and, and at Frisco West. From from yesterday to the Saturday after Easter is exactly 99 days. So we're going to be in a series for 99 days. That's what I thought you'd say, right? It's like, oh my gosh, we're boring. Okay, you're already boring. You hadn't even heard it. But here's, I'm, uh, listen, it's going to be all about Jesus. Okay, so we're taking this series and we're gonna talk about Jesus for 99 days and if you don't like that, then you need help, right? I mean, you need help, right? So, uh, now before I dive into that and tell you how, um, how we're doing it, uh, I wanna review last two weeks because it ties in, 99 ties in to the last two weeks. So last, last couple of weeks, we talked about our mission, which is inviting everyone to find Jesus and helping them move to the center of God's purpose for their lives. Helping everyone, that means everyone. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, we wanna help everyone find Jesus. And then we wanna help everyone move to the center of God's purpose. Not your purpose, not my purpose, not our church, but God's purpose for your life. And that's not ministry in the sense of, oh, everybody has to do what I do, no, 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 wherever you are and whatever you do, that's ministry, and, and, and we wanna help you move to the center of his purpose for that and for your life. And the way that we do this is we love people, we wanna connect together, connect at hope, uh, we wanna grow in community, not just alone, but grow in community, and then we wanna serve others. Now, how this ties in to 99 is we're gonna take how Jesus taught and how Jesus modeled love, connect, grow, serve. So each of these, uh, uh, these weeks, okay, so we're gonna do three weeks on how did Jesus model and teach love, and then three weeks on how did he model and teach connect and, and so forth. We're gonna do that so they're, they're, like, they're like mini series in themselves, right? So we're gonna talk about different things in the series and how Jesus taught us and how Jesus modeled it and, and I'm, so, so excited about that, because I think it's gonna be really helpful for us. Now, anytime, as I've, know, as I've learned this week and the last few weeks, getting ready for this series, um, when you talk about Jesus, when you look at his life, when you look at what he taught, it is going to be convicting. In other words, you're gonna look at your life and you're gonna know what you, what you know about your life and then you're gonna look at what he said and how he taught us to live and what he modeled and it doesn't match up a lot of the times, right? And that's called, um, that's hopefully called conviction in our lives. In other words, we go, wow, I need to be more like Jesus. You know that song we sang, the second song? Make me more like you. This is, that whole se- this is the whole series. Jesus, make us more like you, and, and you're gonna be convicted in certain areas of your life, and I promise you today, you're probably gonna be convicted. It's a, it's a powerful um, scripture and some stories that we're gonna go to, uh, but you can also be offended anytime you study Jesus, anytime you look at Jesus and, and what he taught, there's a great chance that a lot of us are gonna be offended. We're gonna look at this and go, I don't like that or I don't know if I agree with that's what he said. So we're gonna be offended, and I'm hoping that you're mature enough to, to move past that offensive type of posture, and you're able to then make a step towards the center of his purpose for your lives. And that is to say, Lord, less of me, more of you. Teach me, teach me how to love this dying world, right? So. So when we talk about Jesus, it is so, so convicting, it is so offensive, and there, is a, there are times in which you just feel like there's no way I can measure up. There's just no way I can do what he's telling me to do. I can't live like that, I've tried. So, so all I'm saying, all I'm asking is for us to take a step, all of us, take a step to, toward what God wants for you, towards his purpose for your life. Today, uh, we're gonna talk about how Jesus taught us to love the broken, how Jesus taught us to love the broken. Let me start with Matthew 11. 
Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Now, how many probably understand that this is a lot of us right here today? That you are weary for whatever reason. Maybe you're overworked. Uh, in other words, I mean, you work so many hours and you're, and you're exhausted, and, and that's, a, that's a real thing, that kind of weary. But some of us are weary in, in the burdens that we're carrying in our marriage, with our kids, with our finances, with decisions, with work-related things, with relationship-related things. We are weary. We are heavy burdened. Maybe it's a physical thing. See, when we talk about the broken, you've got to understand that, that Jesus says to the broken, come to me. Don't, don't stay away from me. I don't have time for you. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, te- and, and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to, to bear, and the burden I give you <clears throat> is light. He invites us to his table. Those who are broken, those who are weary, those who are burdened, those who are struggling, who are challenged, he says, come, come to me. Now, let me define brokenness, okay? So this is my definition. You won't find it anywhere else, and so that's why it's the right one. Broken, anyone, listen, anyone who has been hurt, wounded, marginalized, cast aside, burdened, going through a hard time, weary of life, or facing life challenges or life challenged, would be someone who could be broken. You realize, you know, sometimes you can be on top of the world and then one thing happens and you become broken. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean you're bad, it just means that you're broken. There are many things in life that cause us to be broken. Here's the good news. Here's the good news that Jesus, in his mission statement, one of them, he says that I have come for those who are broken. Luke chapter four, here's what he says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has appointed me, or anointed me, sorry, to bring good news to who? To the poor, financially, yes, but poor in spirit. Those who find themselves unable to fix themselves, poor. To preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see spiritual blindness, physical blindness, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. See, Jesus came for the broken. He doesn't look at us in all of our brokenness and, and just know that when we, that definition of brokenness, that means everybody. Look at your neighbor and look at him and with a smile and just say, you're broken. You know what I'm saying? Because we all are broken. We are broken in our sin. We are broken in relationships. We are broken in a lot of different ways. And so Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and you're broken. And then he, then he says in another place, I have come for you, for those of us who are poor, for those of us who are held captive, for those of us who are oppressed, for those of us who are blind, for those of us who need his favor. In other words, we need his grace. Because just this week you did something that you shouldn't have done and it's a bad decision and you need his favor, you need his grace. See, we're all broken. So here's where we're going today. So today, we're gonna go to two stories First story, I'm gonna give you two observations. Second story, I'm gonna give you two observations and and then we'll pray. So that's where we're going today. How did Jesus teach us to care for, to love the broken? Luke chapter 14, first story. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner table or the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. Now, have you ever, have you ever had tickets to a Mav, Mavs game in the nosebleeds, and after the first quarter, you see a bunch of empty spaces in the 100 section, and you go down and sit in one of those, right? 
That, that, and I, I have with, been with friends and we've done that before and it is mortifying for me because inevitably someone is going to come and say, hey, these are my seats. And then you have to get out and be humiliated in front of that whole section. You'd be like, yeah, we tried to honor ourselves and sit in better seats, right? So Jesus, Jesus is just saying, um, this whole thing, of, of, he's talking about honoring yourselves and he says, let me give you this advice. When you get invited to a party, when you get invited to the wedding feast, right? So um, he says, when you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit at the seat of honor. In other words, don't go to the front. Don't go like, oh, here I am. What if someone who is more distinguished, in other words, more cool, more loved than you, right? right? So, at least at that moment, then has also been invited. The host will come and say, sorry. I need you to move so that my friends that I really love can sit, you know, in that place. You've ever been there? And then and, and Jesus uses these words. He says, then you'll be embarrassed and you'll have to be taken, you know, to whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. He says, instead, first off, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, listen to this, he will come and say, friend, what are you doing sitting there? No, 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 we have, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of the other people. Then you'll be marching through and they'll be like, oh wow, look at him, he's honored, he, they love him. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Okay, so, so this is the first part. I'm gonna have an observation about this first part. But the story's not over. Then he says this. Then he turned to the host, to his host, he says, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, your brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Okay, so let's go back to that first part. Let me give you the first observation. And the first observation is love walks in humility and doesn't presume honor. In that, in that first part, again, Jesus, I really do believe this, he's talking about a lifestyle of humility. He, he's talking about preferring others in the beginning, not honoring yourself. How many, don't raise your hands, but how many judge people by what they drive? You judge people by where they live, or you judge people by what they wear, and you can either feel above or you can feel below. We do, now we don't say that, right? We don't go up to them and say, I have a better car than you, so I'm better. We don't ever do that. We don't, hey, your shirt is, whoa, wow. You know, we don't ever do that, but we think it, and, and we, so we automatically, <clears throat> we automatically think of ourselves as better right, than, than so many people, we automatically think of ourselves in the line as, the, you know, I got here first, we automatically in traffic think that I deserve that spot. So, so we automatically honor ourselves and, and what Jesus says is love humbles one's self first and lives a lifestyle of that rather than thinks of honor. Like, in other words, I deserve that place. I deserve to sit there. No, 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 let them sit you there. Let somebody else promote you. You don't promote yourself. And it's this lifestyle of humility. It's a lifestyle. Now, you're, I think, if you're, if you're like me, you're wondering, what does this have to do with brokenness? What, what does this have to do with me loving the broken? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me put it on the screen like this. It's only in humility that we could ever even think about loving the broken. It is only in humility, it's only in a posture where, where you're not consistently thinking of yourself as better. I drive better, I live better, I dress better, I have more money, I, I just, I'm just better. I'm just better, I'm sorry, I'm just better. And in our area, it is very, very easy to fall into that trap, and I'm, I'm just, I'm saying this about me, I'm saying this about all of us, it's all of us that kind of fall into this trap because we live in such a blessed, we live in such a great area, and 
most of the country can't afford the housing here. Most of the world could never afford the housing here. And you may not feel rich, but, but we are. And, and there's, it's easy, therefore, to think of ourselves as better and in honor rather than in hu- humility. Not humiliation, but humility. In other words, just humble. And it's only in that state, it's only in humility that you could ever even think about loving the broken. Because it is very hard to have compassion. It is very hard to, to, to wanna help somebody who you're looking down on unless you're going on a trip and you know that's what you're going to be doing. And then you're really nice. But the lifestyle is more, oh, if they're from that country, oh, oh, man. Because they drive like this or that. Or they look like this or that. Or they dress like, or, you know, whatever. It's only, listen, listen. I want you to, we're gonna, we're gonna nail, we're gonna just drive this home. It's only in humility that we could even ever think or ever even think about loving the broken. A lifestyle of humility. Second, number two, is this. Love includes the broken. Love includes the broken. In that, in that passage, Jesus says, hey, don't just invite your friends, just don't invite the rich, just don't invite your relatives. Instead, and it's not saying that you can never do that. We all do that, and it's totally fine, but he says that's the reward you're gonna get, right? You're not gonna get any other reward. That's not like nice of you to invite your neighbors or your friends that are your, you know, you know your posse, your, 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 your hangout people, your relatives, and some of you might get a reward for inviting your relatives, that's for sure, but most of the time, most of the time, it's like, that's the only reward you're gonna get, but I, I wanna teach you a better way. In fact, when you have a party, when you get together, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, invite those who are broken. And let me just say, you don't have to go to New York City to find the broken. You don't have to go to inner city Dallas to find the broken. You don't have to go to Africa or another country to find the broken. They are all around us. We have broken kids because their mom and dad are going through trouble and they cry in their room at night. We have broken teenagers that are bullied at school. We have broken teenagers that are trying to fit in and they, they cannot fit in. It doesn't seem like they have enough you know, coolness or enough money or enough whatever and they can't fit in. They're broken. We have adults that are just big kids and they're broken. And so, so when we talk about the broken, we, we, see, we see crippled and we see lame, and we just kind of go, well, I don't really know that, that many people. No, 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 no. It's more than just physical. It, it, it's everything. There are crippled people relationally. There are lame people who are hurting that we invite, listen, we invite to the table. If you're a teenager and in a cafeteria, you know what I'm talking about. There are those people that are marginalized because they have this or they have that or they don't have this or they don't have, and they're marginalized. And all it would take, all it would just take is just a simple, go sit at the table and just say, hey, I'm John. What can I sit with you today? It's, it's inviting them to the table. Let me ask you this, how are we doing with that? It's, 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 this is very challenging, as I said, very convicting, very challenging, because we are about us, we are about our deal, we are about our family, and that's okay, it's totally fine. But also, he says, humility is the only posture in which you're gonna ever even think about being able to help the broken, and the reason I can say that is because when Jesus says, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. He later says, hey, let me teach you because I am humble and I am gentle at heart. See, Jesus approaches broken people in humility. He doesn't approach broken people and say, you did that again? Are you kidding me? Seriously? Dude, you're jacked up. You know what I'm saying? Jesus doesn't do that. He just, he just says humble. He's humble and I'm gonna teach you and I'm gonna give you rest. So if you're here today and you feel, you feel like you have been marginalized, you feel like you have been cast aside because of whatever, just know that Jesus invites you to, to the table. And, and if Jesus invites you to his table, then why wouldn't we invite you to our table? 
Thank you. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I know this is hard. I know it's easy to preach. It's easy for me to say, hey, you need to be nice. But it's another when I get in my truck on the road. It's another when we're living this. Include people at the table. First story, first story. Second story. Now, if you didn't like that story, if that story was too offensive, just wait. <laughs> Matthew 25, here we go. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then these righteous ones, this is interesting, will reply, Lord, when? When did we ever see you? Because see, they're thinking physically Jesus, physical Jesus, like Jesus was hungry and, and he, they saw, oh, I recognize your Jesus because I've seen your pictures, you know, the one with long hair and a beard. They're thinking physically, they're thinking, you know, oh, Jesus, when? When did we ever uh, feed you? Or, or when you were thirsty, give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing, when? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Let that sink in. Then, then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire pre uh, prepared for you are prepared for the devil and his demons. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply again, thinking, what, when did we ever see you that? We don't remember seeing that. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? I'm just trying to figure that out. I don't remember when. And then he says, I tell you the truth, when you refused, to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters. You were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go in into eternal life. Let me give you um, the first observation, and that is, number one, love doesn't keep score. In other words, um, it's interesting to me, you know, obviously when they figure out, oh, you're not talking about literal Jesus, you're just talking about people in general. They're, they just don't have any idea when, when did we ever do this? Why, because listen, I want you to hear this. It was a lifestyle, not a project. I'm taking uh, some of our team to inner city New York City to serve uh, on the streets of New York City, homeless and, and, and food and, and you know, prayer and whatever we can do to help. And that's, that's good. L listen, please don't misunderstand me. That is so good. And we invite people all the time to go on mission trips all over the world. And we say, let's go serve. But that's a project. What we're, try what we're trying to accomplish with those things is an on-ramp. In other words, once you go, there's an on-ramp so that you say, you know, I need to do this more often right where I live. I need to not just serve New York City. I need to serve Frisco. I need to serve Dallas. I need to serve in some way. And it's an on-ramp. Does it make sense? But that's a project. And, and what Jesus is talking about is a lifestyle where you're not keeping record. There's no record of how many times I went to prison or how many times I clothed somebody. It's just a natural part of our lives. A natural part of our lives. Number two, second observation, is love or the lack of love matters. Love will be rewarded. Lack of love will be too. And they're very different rewards. They're very different rewards. When, when, when I picture the sheep and the goats, and, and, and I don't know how this will look, what, what it will look like, 
But I, I just picture that day, and um, you know, Jesus is there, and he's saying, hey, John, you want you to go over here, and I go over here, I am praying there are not horns around me. You know what I'm saying? Goat horns, in other words. I'm praying that there are people, bah, you know, <laughs> and, and that I'm in the wrong, I am in the wrong group. I, I'm praying for white wool. I, I really am. I'm praying that, that I wouldn't be a goat, but that I'd be a sheep. And this scripture was lived out in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a really interesting way for me this week. I traveled to uh, Mission, Texas, which is in the Rio Grande Valley. It's where I'm from. I'm from Harlingen and Mission and McAllen are you know, right next to each other. And, and my friend, the week before, Rick Gannon, who pastors Palm Valley Church, um, asked me, he said, hey, we're doing, we're doing some services Sunday through Wednesday and they're, they're prayer services and we're worship and it's gonna be our core people that will show up to this. And, and would you happen to have a night that you could come and, and just encourage our, our people? And I said, man, how about Tuesday night? So I flew out Tuesday to, to McAllen and got to the airport, taught that night and we just had a great time. I love that church, what a great church. And, and then I went to the airport the next morning. It was in and out, I mean, just boom, ready to go. And uh, I was in the airport, McAllen International Airport, and I was uh, reading a book. There's like this, this area of which a bunch of tables, and, and you could go to the bar, or you could go get coffee, or you could get a soft drink or whatever, and you just come. And I was just sitting there reading. And a family, <clears throat> a family, uh, a dad and two girls walks up. And you know, I see him walking, and he's got one little girl in, in his arms. I, I would say the girl is probably 18 months to two years old, and then a little girl on this side, uh, probably three or four years old, and I looked up from my book, and, and I caught her eye, and I just, not weirdly, but I just smiled, you know, <laughs> smiled, smiled at her, and uh, I love little kids, and, and I smiled at her, and, and, and I think could tell she was caught off guard, and she just looked at me, and then she just looked the other way and went with her dad, and they sat to the table right next, I mean, right next to me, and, and then later, they went to go get something to drink, and the mom, the, I'm guessing it was the mom, came, and she had a little baby, a nursing you know, kind of baby, and she brought uh, her to the table, and then she had a, a, an envelope uh, about this big, one of those, you know, you put, thing, you know, put them in this way, and then you close it, and it tabs on it. So she, she took out a thing, and she laid it on the table, and I, I could read it because it was real big, and it says, please help us, we don't speak English. And then it says on the second line, would you help us find the right line? And then it says, thank you, with a smiley face. And I could tell that, because uh, I'm from the valley, and I know pretty much you can tell where somebody's from, and it looked like they were from Central America. And uh, I don't know their story. I don't. I have no idea what their story is. But I... I just looked at them, and I thought, I wonder, I wonder. I went to my gate and was boarding the plane and got sat, uh, I got in my seat, and uh, the dad and the two little girls were on the same plane. The mom was not. I don't know where she went, but she was not on the plane. And they came, and I caught the girl's eye. Again, again, not weirdly, but I caught the girl's eye, and, and I just smiled real big, and uh, this time, she just smiled, she just smiled really big, I can't even do it, and white teeth, and just looked at me, and then went on. And this is not a political statement, okay? The, the immigration is hot topic, but it is complicated in our nation, and, and there are way smarter people than me who are trying desperately and, and authentically to try to figure that out, I hope. And, and so this is not a political statement. However, as a Christ follower, I am a Christ follower before I am an American. I hope you know that, all of us. And I saw in their eyes, and, and they, there, there may not be any issues with immigration with them. It felt like, and, and in the airport, and every time I've gone to this airport, there are, there are kids, teenagers, and in this one there was a teenager, there were a whole line of teenagers sitting in one section and they all had the same shoes. They had blue deck shoes, which I've seen 
countless times before when I've gone to this airport and they, they all looked like they were from Central America as well and, and they were just sitting there waiting to go somewhere. I have no idea where. But it dawned on me, and I don't know why it's not dawned on me before um, like this, but as I read Matthew 25 and I looked at that little girl and those guys, those teenagers, and, and I, just, I just want to remind us, listen, I just want, I'm not trying to make any weird political thing. I'm just trying to remind us that those people are real people. And they have names. And they have children. And I don't know their stories, but but I, I just want to remind us as Christ followers, as Jesus, as Jesus said, I want you to be a sheep, and this is how you be a sheep. I just want you to remember that there's people in this world that your ancestors came from somewhere, 98% of them weren't here. They came from somewhere. And let us not, in, in the politicizing of this, let us not forget that these are real people that Jesus loves. And if Jesus loves them, if Jesus doesn't have an attitude, I understand we've got to fix the, the system. There's laws that have to be upheld, and I'm not saying anything about the, that. That's all good. I'm just saying that they're people, and that little girl, she smiled at me. I was reminded they're just people. Some of them good, a lot of them good. A lot of them, maybe not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. So after the service last night, I knew I would get some possible emails, right? I, just, I know you, and uh, no, I'm kidding, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I got, a, I got an email, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, ah. Oh. And if it starts out negative, I just delete it. So <laughs> just know that you do not threaten me at all. I drive a truck. <laughs> I got this email. I got this email after service. I decided that if people are going to write you angry emails, I was going to write also. But to say in quotations, gracias. Lately, we have heard a lot. We don't want you here. Go back home. Stay on your side of the wall. And no matter how many green cards we have as immigrants, it is always hurtful. Coming from the valley and originally from Mexico, we know this is a complicated issue and we always try not to say anything or say much. But I have to say that today at church, we felt so valued and appreciated that, uh, that it's hard to explain because we left thinking, wow, at church today, we felt loved. Um, hold on. And you know what? I couldn't help but think, why, why, why would they not feel loved anyway? If you're a person of another color, and, and, and you have been marginalized, if you're a person from another country, and you have been marginalized because predominantly the white were in control. And that may be true. But, but I want you as, as hopeful, I can't speak for the country, I can't speak for the world, but I can hopefully speak for us that Hope Fellowship, no matter the color of your skin and no matter what country you are from, you are loved by God. You are loved, no matter how broken you are, how sinful you are, you are loved by God. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and come to me, all of you who are marginalized and strangers and, and, and crippled and lame and, and blind. He says, come to me. Don't, please don't send me an email on your politics. I could care less about that, it's real, I know it's real. What I'm talking about is a Jesus way of living in which we look at people and we love them no matter where they're from. And listen, we take a posture of humility rather than honor. Honor that says I'm better than you, 
I have more money than you. I have more power than you. Listen, listen, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. As Christ followers, as Christ followers, let us love people the way Jesus taught us to love people. You may grew up in the South. You may have things that were taught to you by your grandpa or by your dad, your uncles. We, I love you too. If you think differently than me, but my heart for you is I'm gonna change you. I'm gonna get, my, I'm gonna get you in a headlock. And I'm, I'm gonna help you understand that as a Christ follower, you don't have the option of hate. We don't. As a Christ follower, we do not, listen, we do not have the option of hate. And if you hate someone or look down on someone because they're a different color, what year are we in? This is not the Jesus way. So if you're from India, or if you're from Mexico, or if you're from Honduras, or if you're from a sinful past, if you're from a broken past, if you're from a broken marriage, if you're from a broken, addicted life, you are invited to the table here. Because that's what Jesus would do. And if you don't like that, I love you. And I hope you change your mind. Because this series is not about what we would do. It's about what Jesus would do. And it's about what Jesus has taught us to do. So let us walk the way of love. Let us walk the way of love, hope. And let's take a step toward the center of his will for our lives and for this church. And let us be a people that when people walk through the door, they don't have to wonder if they're gonna be loved. Because you were broken and I was broken, and Jesus welcomed me to the table, why would we not help those and take a posture of humility? Because it's only in humility that you could ever even think about helping and loving the broken. Lord, help us. And I know your way is offensive. And some of us right now, we're just like, well, I don't know if I'd have said that. I don't know. I get it. I get it. But Lord, I, I really hope that beyond what I have said, what you say would, would, would take hold of our hearts and that we would be convicted about what we've said and we would be convicted about the way that we've lived Like Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness can't drive out darkness. Hate, it's not gonna drive out any, it's only the light. Love, and Lord, I pray that for us. I pray that we would be a people of love. It's messy, it's complicated, but Lord, help us walk in love. May your kingdom come. May your will be done right here in our lives, in our families, in this church, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name.